All right, so today I'm gonna to show you how to install a security camera at your house. So that camera right there is an Amcrest IP3M954E. That's on one end of my driveway. And on the opposite side, around the corner, I got another camera. It's exactly the same model right there. So a lot of companies especially um, home security providers, um, also uh, who's getting into this, cable TV companies, everybody seems to be getting onto the, the home security bandwagon. It's a pretty big industry. Uh, a lot of them will sell you their own proprietary system. You have to use their camera, you have to use their equipment, their monitoring service, and it can get pretty expensive. So what I've done here, those two cameras that you just saw cost about, I think, 70 or $80 a piece, and there are no recurring costs. So what do I mean by that? So once you buy the cameras and install them, there's no monthly fee to monitor it or anything. So what you can do, or what I've done, is I've set those up to record to a server that I have that I'll show you. All right, so forgive right the now. mess, but each one of those cameras has a Cat5e Ethernet cable, the same type of cable that you use to uh, plug your computer into the network. These cables here. Uh, one of the, I, I think it was actually these two cables come from the cameras, one each. Those go into a PoE switch, which uh, what that does is that basically adds power to the Ethernet cable. So those cameras are run only by only with power supplied by those Ethernet cables. And whenever those cameras see motion, they record to this computer that you see down here, which is actually out of its little alcove for service right now at a hard disk failure. So they connect to that computer, I believe, over um, the SMB protocol, which is the protocol that Windows uses for file shares, even though it's actually a Linux box. And um, what that amounts to is a directory um, that, or I guess a directory per camera that records both stills and uh, video as motion occurs. All right, so once those cameras see motion, you can see this directory here is called IP Cam Driveway 1. That's the camera, uh, the first camera I showed you. And here's IP Cam Driveway 2. That's the second camera I showed you. So whenever they see motion, they create directories that correspond to the date and time and you see on the right if I click on one of these we'll see what that is so this looks like probably just raindrops it was raining at the time you could see here rain rain so they're pretty cool you can set these up to record or I'm sorry to notify you via text message when it sees motion although I will warn you um, these cameras these particular cameras are not really that sophisticated they don't differentiate between a person walking across your driveway or a tree blowing in the wind or a shadow. Uh, you'll get a, an alert for each one of those. So I've actually turned the alerts off because they're a royal pain in, in the neck. I'm at work, I get 300 text messages a day from these stupid cameras, it drives me up the wall. So I'm actually working on a system to filter through that and once I perfect that, I'll give you guys some more info as to how that works. And again, this, uh, what you, everything you see so far is no recurring costs. As long as you have a computer that you have that you can record this video to or these motion, this motion to, uh, you're all set. Those cameras are actually mini computers. These, this is the actual web interface for the cameras. Um, so this is a view from that camera, the second camera that you saw. Um, they're actually made by, you know, they're, they're Amcrest cameras. They're actually made by a company called Dawa. Uh, which is very well known in the security industry and this IP3M 954E is actually a DAWA IPC HFW1320S. So you can actually download the DAWA firmware for the IP3M 954E. Um, I'm sorry, you can download the firmware for the IPC HFW1320S from DAWA and flash that onto the, the uh, MCRES camera. I found through experimentation and research that Dawa seems to make almost all of the Amcrest cameras. Um, is that every single one? Probably not, but all the ones that I've purchased have been and all the ones I've researched have been. So as we were talking about before, there's a lot of settings that you have here for uh, motion detection. So you can set up which areas will trigger motion alerts. Um, and. You can also have uh, video tampering alerts. I don't, I don't really use those. Scene changing alerts, don't use those. And if you go to storage, notice here, like I mentioned before, when motion occurs, 
I have it set to go to a NAS device, Network Attacks Attached Storage. So I do both uh, record video and I record a snapshot. And all you have to do is configure your NAS device, as I've done here, and make sure that the, the user that you use has sufficient permissions, or just make it anonymous writable. And uh, that's all you have to do. Now in terms of how you wire these up, it just so happens I have a new camera here. This is a different type of camera. I believe this one is also made by Dawa. This one is a, what is it? This one is eight megapixel, whereas the other one, the other ones were three. This one is a IP8M T2499EW. It's an IP8M T2499EW. The reason why I chose this camera is it's about the same price as the other ones. I think it was maybe $30 more, so it's maybe $120, $110. I forget exactly what I paid for it. It's obviously higher resolution. This is 4K, as you can see at the bottom. Um, again, I believe it's also made by Dawa. Uh, but one of the cool things is that it has the Sony uh, Starvis uh, imaging sensor, which has very, very good night vision. Uh, far better than the, the cameras that you saw. This is also uh, IP67 rated, so it can get wet. I wouldn't recommend immersing it, but it also does H.265 video compression, so the recorded videos will be much smaller in size. Um, so I'm getting pretty excited to use this. You can see here some of the features in the box. Pick this up on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description of the video so you guys can get to it as well. This is what, I already unboxed it, and this is what it looks like. This one also has a slot for an SD card, uh, though I don't think I'll be using that. I might use it as a backup, but it's pretty compact, aesthetically pleasing, and it just mounts the same way the other ones do. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run a wire up in my attic. So you see here, all the wires come down there, these tan wires. So I'm gonna have to crawl all the way up there, all the way over here, all the way over the vaulted ceiling because I'd like to put that right over my front door over there. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a cable that's uh, far longer than it needs to be so I can experiment on the exact location before I drill any holes and do anything permanent. So what I'll do is I'll just run the cable inside the house and kind of run it through a window or the front door or something along those lines until I get the positioning just right. And then we'll just snake the cable through the attic. All right, so you might be wondering what you have to have on hand to make your own cables. Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, this is the Cat5e cable that I was talking to you about. This is just riser cable. Um, it's designed to be used inside walls. Uh, it's not plenum rated, so you can't run this through a return airspace because uh, it does not have a fire retardant coating or, or one that will not be caustic if it is a... Uh, or toxic, rather, if it, uh, if it does ignite. So this cannot be used in, in air returns or air spaces. But it can be used inside walls. Anyway, enough of that. You get this at Lowe's or Home Depot or online. You'll need a crimper, you'll need a cutter, and the actual cable ends. All this stuff you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot, um, not that expensive. I would say this box, 500 feet of cable, was. Don't quote me, but I bought it. I bought it so many years ago. It's probably 30 or 40 bucks, uh, maybe 50. Uh, my system admin tells me I overpaid for it, which is entirely possible. And I think the kit that included this and this was maybe another 15 bucks, so very affordable. I don't usually make my own cables, uh, but in this case I need a very customized length and I don't want to buy, they probably don't have a cable that's exactly that length. So, all right, so let's get this set up in the office. All right, so I got the cable box over there, a box of cable rather. I got the cable coming out this way, going over the furniture, over the carpet, out the front door and I pulled out a little bit extra because there was a kind of a crimp in the cable that I didn't really want to have to deal with so bring it out to about here that should give us more than enough room to experiment and figure out what position the camera makes the most sense so I'll leave it right about there and we'll cut the cable and we'll put some ends on it now I should have mentioned uh, explicitly that these cameras do not require 
a network video recorder or NVR. Um, that's kind of that VCR looking device that a lot of camera systems ship with. Um, it's really a dedicated computer that the cam with, a, with a hard drive that the cameras record to. So, but here, again, I had, the, had this computer already, so this is really my NVR, uh, my net network video recorder. You can use these cameras with an NVR, but you don't have to because they're IP cameras. Um, so they can be standalone devices. Uh, you saw I accessed them via web browser. So they're really, they're really cameras that are mini computers. So again, no NVR required. All right, so the first step is to strip the end of the cable using this tool. So what you do is you put the cable on the end here so that the cable just kind of sticks out like that. And just rotate. Like this. And that outer jacket should just pop right off. Now you'll see a bunch of colored wires. You'll see orange, orange with white stripe. See brown with a white stripe, brown, green, and green with a white stripe, and blue and blue with a white stripe. So these wires have to be inserted into these connectors here. So what I usually do, as I forgot here, is put the stream relief on first. This prevents the uh, cable from getting snagged. Because if you're dragging it through an attic or even around a corner, that little tang right there can get snagged and break off and the cable is useless to replace that end. So. I always wire cables to the standard called TIA586B um, and left to right the wire colors will be white orange orange, white green blue, white blue green, white brown brown. Again that's white orange orange, white green blue, white blue green, white brown brown so what i do is i line them up in that order left to right so let's find the white orange wire let me cut this little fibery thing off because it's getting in the way disclaimer i am not a professional cable maker so those of you guys that do this for a living feel free to laugh away all right, so white orange. Here's white orange. And then we need the orange cable, which is right here. Let's put those together. Man, my eyes must be going bad. This is getting tough to see. All right, so white orange. Orange, got it. Then white green, then blue. Which one? Is it? This one looks blue. Oh, apparently those some, those wires got cut somehow. Got to start over. One wire broke off. Does happen sometimes. So if that happens, just snip it and then start the procedure over. I'll get set up and resume when I have the wires in the right order. Alright, so that's what it should look like when you're all done. Probably can't see that too well, but left to right it's white orange orange, white green blue, white light blue green, light brown brown. When I say light, I really mean white. So now it's just a simple matter of putting them in the connector that way. Again, left to right. So I'm just going like that. It's going to show up backwards for you guys. And that's kind of what it looks like when it's in there. And then just make sure that all the cables go all the way to the end there because you're going to use the crimping tool to lock it in place. And if you don't get them down all the way to the end, you won't get a good connection. And then you'll have to do it again. 
So again, just check your wire colors again. You have white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. I think we're good with this one. So now to crimp it, stick it in the RJ45 section of your crimping tool. Simply squeeze and release. Now it's locked in place. And that strain relief that we put on simply slides over like so. Now you have a semi-professional looking cable. And we'll just repeat up for the other side. All right, so I finished making both ends of the cable. I plugged one into my network switch up here, uh, one end there, and the other end into my laptop right there. Now, if you have a computer with an Intel wired network adapter, uh, and you can tell by going to device manager, and if you see something like this, where it says in Intel ethernet connection I219V, there's a lot of different ones out there, but if you see something along those lines, Intel has some really, really great uh, utilities for their network adapters that you can use um, to test cables, uh, which is kind of rare. So to get there, just to go to Intel's website, um, what I did is I just Googled I219V, and one of the first results was this Intel network adapter driver for Windows 10. So I downloaded ProWin x64.exe, installed it, and in addition to updating the drivers, it gives you this wonderful utility here. So you can see here, I've, I've got the cable plugged in. It's a one gigabit full duplex connection, which is what we want to see. And let's do a cable test and see what comes back. So it's running the cable test now. You can see here, the cable length is 29 meters, polarity is normal. Everything is good across the board. So this cable is good. And this is a really nice utility to have or a nice option to have these cable tests, especially if you're not that experienced with making cables. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Thankfully, it's very difficult to screw something up when making these cables. But it's difficult, to, it's easy to get a wire crossed or in a wire in the wrong spot. And this cable, this test will tell you that. Let's do a connection test to see what that does. I've never run that one before. All right, nothing all that interesting. All right, so once you have your cable made, now it's time to unplug it from the computer, plug it into the camera, and actually I guess we have to unplug it from the computer and plug it into the PoE switch, because this right now is not plugged into the PoE switch. Let's undo this, that's out. And we'll undo this end here, and this is my PoE switch up here. Let's get a little more slack in this cable. In. There we go. Let's plug the other end into our camera. The camera comes with this little port right here. Simply plug your cable in, like so. And this thing should start booting up. Let's uh, bring this outside. All right, now after the camera's had a chance to boot up, your network router or whatever device your network provides, the DHCP service, the dynamic, which is the dynamic host configuration protocol, um, you'll need to log into that device uh, and see what IP address was assigned to your camera. So in my case, I have an Untangle Unified Threat Management device running, which provides many things. This is the Untangle box right here. This is a bit off topic, but Untangle is really, really a great service. Uh, it's about 100 bucks a year for home use. We also use that at, at work, but you can see that it gathers quite a bit of statistics about all your network traffic. Um, it provides built-in virus scanning, uh, blocking, spam filtering, all sorts of lovely things. So, I don't really have it configured yet, but this is a great, great piece of software. So I'm going to log in and go to my DHCP server. So I'm going to look for the host name, which is this AMC thing. 
think it prints it on the box what the host name is. It could be the wrong one. But it's typically just um, the host name is usually just a combination of AMC plus the MAC address, which is the hardware identifier for that particular device. I think the hardware identifier is actually printed on the device itself. I'm trying to find where it is printed because I thought it was in the box, but maybe not. But again, if you get this camera, it's probably going to follow that pattern, that AMC. So just look for something in your DHCP server with that, with that string. I don't see it printed anywhere on here. That's kind of unusual. Maybe we have to take it apart. Anyway. Most networks are going to be like a 192.168.1. whatever. Uh, I don't run that type of network here. I use a different IP address range, so ignore what I have here. But in this case, my device is 10.224.37.170, this AMC 51DF4, and so on. So I'm just going to copy that IP address, paste it into Internet Explorer. I believe these cameras do require Internet Explorer, unfortunately. So this is the new camera. I'm going to log in. I believe the default password is admin, but it should be in your documentation that comes with the camera. All right, so now we're looking at uh, the wall in my, inside my house. So this is what the camera sees right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook up the camera to the cell phone app so we can go outside and look at the live video free feed from our cell phone so we can see what the camera is seeing as we position it. It makes this process go a lot faster. All right, had I read the manual, I would have realized that there's a tiny little screw in there, and there's an included Torx wrench that you can use to take that screw out, and it should loosen the whole assembly. And then we can uh, see if the label is there. I'm just using the Torx wrench that comes with it. I'm loosening it a little bit. I feel things loosening up quite a bit. All right, looks like maybe it has to come out. Pretty clever locking mechanism. Okay, there we go. So that shield comes off. And it looks like the camera comes out. Let's see a sticker. Oh, here's a sticker. Sticker's right here. That's what we're looking for. All right, so we got to take a picture of that with our app. All right, so let's try this again. I'm going to click P2P setup, and I'm going to scan that barcode. So the camera is looking for the code. Got it. Okay. So then we just got to... Complete the, the, the process here, give the camera a name, log in a password. Uh, let's do, I'm gonna call it front door. I'm just typing into my phone here, it's not that exciting. Okay, so it's connecting. Uh, we'll skip the walkthrough. Okay. So let's see. Not seeing anything yet. Maybe I have to reboot the app. Let's go back in. Click on add, front door. Okay, I give up. Let's try rebooting the camera. All right, so I finally got it to work. It turns out it just didn't, couldn't be in SD mode. 
because this camera has no standard definition stream set up right now. But as soon as I put it in high def mode, it started working okay. And we can see that it is. You can see the same image. If I put my elbow over the camera, you can see it shows up on both screens. So pretty cool. All right, so now that we got that working, let's go outside and start setting this up and figure out where we want to place it. All right, so I tried several areas. There's really no flat surface in this house, so most of what I see is the edge of the gutter or just a very small piece of the driveway there. I found that that spot right there, on the bottom of that horizontal beam, right in that corner, seems to work pretty well. I can get a field of vision from the green Jeep, the truck, all the way to the mango tree. So I think that's where we're going to put it. So we're going to drill a hole up in that corner right there, snake the cable down that corner, and around over to the camera. So you won't see it from the outside. Hopefully you won't see the camera, but I guess that remains to be seen. You know what? Let's walk to the street and see what we can see from there. <clears throat> yeah, you'll see it. But I guess the camera has to be able to see you. For you. If you can't see it, it can't see you. <clears throat> Boy, it's a tough call. Do I want to put it there? I really don't want to put it on that beam there because that's solid concrete. That'll be fun to get into. <clears throat> I could mount it up there in that flat space, but then we'd miss quite a bit. <clears throat> well, maybe not. Let me get a ladder. All right, so I used my handy Denny DeWalt drill and I drilled two holes. One hits hit wood in the corner and I moved a couple inches over and we're free and clear. So I'm gonna stick one of these glow sticks up there. Hopefully my trusty helper will hold it for me. While I climb in the attic in the, in the abyss, in the heat of June. That'll give me something to look for. I'm gonna have to hold it. Beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna get a flashlight. I'm gonna get suited up to go in the attic. I'm actually gonna cut the end off this cable because it's gonna to be too big to fit through that hole. So we'll just cut this piece off and we'll do a new one. All right, so I'm in the attic. I got the cable in my hand and I have to get all the way over there. So this is gonna be lots of fun. So I'm snaking the cable under the rafters. I feel like I was just in here yesterday. All right, this is a two-handed operation. I'm gonna climb all the way over there. Quick change of plans. Um, that area is extremely inaccessible, so I'm gonna try to insert this cable from down here and try to grab it from above with one of those fish poles. So these things are pretty cool. They screw together and uh, obviously you can see this one has a hook on the end. So my intent is to screw these together, stay as far away from that area as possible. I shoved a lot of cable up there and try and hook it with this hook and try to grab it that way. We'll see if it works. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but I think that's the cable down there all the way at the end on the left. So I'm going to try to grab it. All right. So after a lot of work, got the cable. Now I just gotta fish it to the other side of the house down by where the office is. So I'm just gonna use the hook to kind of pull it down that way. All right, I snake the cable all the way down to that junction box up there. I know it's not the right box, but that's beside the point. Now I'm just gonna snake the cable. Let's see, is it this one? It is. And there we go. Oops. Sorry about that. The garage door was starting to close. It's got on one of those automatic timers. All right. So now we just got to put a new end on this cable and plug it in up there. 
And I'll show you what the other end looks like. We gotta clean that up a bit too. Off. That's what we got there. So we got a little bit more work to do to clean that up, but at least the hard part's done. Got the cable hanging right there with the end. All right, so I got the frame screwed up to that beam right there. It's just loosely there right now. Got my Cat 5B cable. I already terminated the other end. So now all we really need to do is Install the face frame, tighten it down, and aim it. I'm going to build a little box, uh, probably out of wood, and paint it to match the house to hide the wiring. That's probably the easiest way to deal with that. So I'm uh, going to use our wrench and just tighten this up. All right, I got the camera loosely bolted up there. I'm going to get the cell phone so we can aim it. And again, I'll hide the wiring uh, with a little box that I'll build. All right, without even touching it, the aim is actually pretty good. I'm going to probably aim it a little bit to the left. I want to catch uh, the mango tree on that side so I can steal it, see when people are stealing them. Other than that, just minor adjustments. I think I showed you guys this tool that comes with it to tighten it down. All right, so I put a cable staple right there. I just used a coax cable staple. Zip tied the wires to make them look kind of nice. And uh, thank you. And uh, got everything aimed. Now I just got to build a little box to go around there to hide the rest of the wires and uh, paint it to match the house. And that's kind of the finished product right there. Now we just got to configure it to record to the NAS device, just like the other cameras. All right, guys, so I got the new camera set up to log uh, alerts to the NAS device, as you can see here. I have both motion detection and alarms for uh, video and for snapshots. And I have the NAS device configured as my local server that I showed you earlier. And I confirmed that, and I changed the host name of the camera to IP Cam Driveway 3 just to differentiate between that and the others. And I confirmed that everything appears to be working right. So I got this little that sound, and I got my neighbor's car pulling the driveway, and I got a vehicle driving down the street. And I got audio. Everything's working great. So, mission accomplished. Hope you guys uh, learned something and hope this helped you. Take care. And if you like this, please subscribe.